Alright. Hey, my name is Forrest, welcome back. So lately, I've talked about some algorithms, and I've talked about some data structures. I've shown what they look like, how the code behind them works, why it's important to choose right ones, and mentioned how they're used. But it's been brought to my attention that I haven't shown how they're used in real world applications. Take a social media app, for example. Every single one has a feed, a feed of whatever content that that social media application, that platform provides. In this instance, it's a bunch of posts that are used as examples because I'm still working on this. But are these posts stored in a data structure? Kind of, kind of not really, but kind of. We have to work our way to it. As you can see, the posts are actually stored in an array of objects, or at least when they're being used. See, they're stored actually in the database. In this instance, it's a PostgreSQL database with all of the posts being stored in a table. And this table has all of the information. Each row is a single post and it has the unique ID, created that, updated that, the user ID for who created it, the title, content, URL, image, you get the idea. But then we need to use this. So the way we use it is that we call to our database and we fetch those posts from our database and we put them in descending order so the most recent is up top. And then once we do that, we return the data for whenever this function is being called, like right here. So we are calling our fetch posts and storing all of that data, remember what it's returning, into our array of objects. Just like you can have an array of strings where each value is a string or an integer, each one here is an object, so each object has all of that post data that you need. And then we map through it just to make sure that our types are all consistent and things of that nature. And then what we're doing here is returning it by passing it through posts and the post feed. As you can see right here, post is the parameter that's being passed into post feed. And then we are using it throughout our code and however we see fit. With this being that front end code that you see here, so within each post, we need to identify the user and that user's username and profile, the title, the content, the upvotes, and that's what we do down here as well. We get the user posts image, we get the username, we get when it's created at, that's what this date is here, the post title, as you can see, so on and so forth. So that's how an array would be used in an instance like this. But what about an algorithm? So as you can see here, we have home, that's where we're at right now. And you can notice that we have these being upvoted, one, 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 and then there's a zero down here, and then there's a one right here. If we go to most upvoted, you can now see that all of those that are actually upvoted by me, the sole user, are at the top because it's ordered from the most upvoted down. But how do we do that? It's actually very, very simple. So what we do is we do the same thing as before. We fetch the posts. So remember, we're using this, we're calling to our database and bringing in all of that data, storing it in an array of objects. But then we are sorting that array of objects based on vote count, which is one of the values within the object as you can see right here. And this right here is a sorting algorithm. Now in JavaScript, it depends on what engine you're using. So if you're using Chrome or Node.js, that uses the V8 engine, so that uses TimSort, which is a hybrid sorting algorithm derived from merge sort and insertion sort. This is also what Python uses. It was actually developed for Python. However, if it's in Firefox, which uses the SpiderMonkey engine, then it uses variations of merge sort. And then Safari uses JavaScript core engine, whereas the specific algorithm used can vary, as far as I know at least. So right there is a real world use case of how arrays, array of objects in this instance are used in an actual application, as well as how sorting algorithms are used. And I'm really glad we could do that one because it not only fits the criteria of that original comment where it wasn't really asking about real world applications, but more so how you can utilize and use data structures and algorithms in our own projects, as he said, but it also hit that other criteria of how they're using real world applications like a social media application. Whereas this one that we're about to discuss, eh, not so much, but it does fit the how you can use them in your own projects. And, and it translates outward, but not like it lays the foundation. It allow, like it allows you to learn about data structures and algorithms and how they're utilized in 
AI, AI is very broad. It doesn't just have to be machine learning, by the way, and things of that nature. But this project will showcase arrays, hash maps, array lists, linked lists, hash sets, and how they're used, as well as DFS and BFS and ASTAR, which are three of the algorithms that I went over in my three types of algorithms video. And all of this in my Sokoban Solver Java application that I built about seven years ago in my Intro to Artificial Intelligence class. Wait, what happened? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. GTC 2024 is about to start, March 18th to 21st. It's the number one AI conference for developers, and your boy will be there live and in person. Well, not live, but in person. I'll be attending a handful of tours, workshops, and of course, the main keynote presented by the CEO of NVIDIA himself, Jensen Huang, who is also the same man who signed this GTX 4090 GPU that I'm giving away to one of y'all. Didn't see that coming, did you? All you have to do to enter is attend a GTC 2024 session. Virtually is obviously fine. Then send me a screenshot of your session to prove it. Just follow these instructions. Register for GTC using my link in the description box. It's free to attend virtually. And if you've already registered, that's perfectly fine. Then as you're attending a GTC session, take a screenshot and fill out the Google form also linked below. And while not part of this giveaway, it may or may not, it won't, give you a better chance to win the GPU if you sign up to my newsletter, DevNotes. Also free, devnotesdaily.com. That'll be the third link in the description. We'll be covering everything mentioned at this event that developers should know and summarized beautifully and concisely for y'all. If you're curious about my top choices that I'll be attending, those are linked below as well and include AI-assisted developer tools for accelerated computing, AI for agriculture because farmer, and implementing Omniverse to produce cinematic content. That one seems wildly interesting. And if you're going in person and you see me, feel free to say what's up. All right, now back to the video. So the Sokoban Solver. You've probably played Sokoban one way or another without even realizing it, especially if you played Pokemon and you had to move all of those rocks in a certain order to get them where they need to go so you have a path. That's Sokoban. That's literally the game. Sokoban, I think I'm pronouncing that right, is a puzzle game where you push boxes to their designated spots, but you have to figure out which boxes to push where and in what order so you don't block yourself off from the rest of the boxes. A beautiful game to practice some algorithms on and we really get intricate with some of these data structures. And it all starts with the board state. This is a snapshot of where the walls, boxes, goals, and the player are located on the game board, that is. These are bit fields. And then we capture this snapshot of the game using a specialized data structure. Take a look here. So we use hash maps and we have the hash map for exactly what it says here, character to bit field by mapping. So it's for bi-directional mapping between the characters you see in their bit field codes because well, hash maps are great at quickly finding and updating these items. So as you can see, we have a new hash map, chart of field with a character and a byte. And these are our bytes, as you can tell. And these are our characters that will represent said bytes. And you can see a little bit more of how that works here. But then down here, we use arrays. So the array, it's in charge of holding the entire game board's layout, which is really just a, it's a big grid that keeps everything in its place, the walls, boxes, everything. And we chose an array because it's well organized and provides a fixed size container that perfectly matches the 2D setup of this Sokoban puzzle. Meanwhile, we have sets for the goals and the boxes to keep an eye on where the movable boxes and the player are because a box and a player cannot be in the same location at the same time. And of course sets, they allow us to really easily add, move, or check these positions. And then with every move or push you make in the game, you're essentially changing this data structure, which leads to transformations that you see on the screen, which you can see how that works in these methods down here. So here we're returning whether or not the player can move in a certain direction. Down here we're returning turning the new board state after moving in a certain direction. Down here, we're returning true if the next move has the input bit field, that otherwise it'll be false, and you get the idea. Now, if we wanna come over to BFS, this is one of our mini solvers. Let's get that out the way. And as you know, BFS is breadth first search. So it's a layer by layer exploration strategy that examines all possible moves from a given node before moving on to the moves successors or next layer. So our BFS solver here inherits from abstract solver. 
which as you can see over here, sets up a framework for a search-based puzzle solver like these. This is this is where the real magic happens. Here are, here's our constructor for this class. We're first passing in that board state, which will be assigned to current state. Here, we're preparing a list. Well, technically it's a set, a hash set, as you can see here, to keep track of all the puzzle states we've already seen. And here is our backtrack hash map which stores every move the solver makes and where that move came from. This way, once it finds the solution, it can trace all of those steps back so you have a final solution after the fact. Otherwise, then you do it once, you forget how to do it, you have to do it again, doesn't make sense. And down here is where our search algorithm is implemented with the use of a queue determining the order which states are explored. So first in, first out, exploring all possible moves from a given state before moving on to the moves that result from those moves. So covering the search space layer by layer as BFS should. And you can see how this translates back over in our BFS solver. This is, it, it's convenient, but it's annoying when I just want to highlight something and go. So in our BFS solver class, we initialize with the board state set and our queue being implemented as a linked list because we'll be adding and removing many states as we explore the puzzle. And because linked lists in Java comes with methods are already to unqueue and dequeue by default. So it just made it easier for me. And that's, that's really why I used it. And down in this method, we create an array list of valid moves, where when we move, we log it in the backtrack hash map. This keeps track of where each move came from. And then we add the move to the queue for further exploration. That, without really going down like a crazy rabbit hole, is all, that's all I got for you. I don't know if I answered the question. I oftentimes stray, uh, but I have fun doing it, so take the video for what it is. Feel free to subscribe if you enjoyed the content and you want to see more like this. Again, I'm Forrest, and I'll see you in the next one.